Dr Becky and welcome back to another Sky News for November 2018 and quite appropriately the moon looks absolutely amazing outside my window right now when I'm filming so why don't we start with what you can see in the sky this month in November. So a couple of planets to look out for this month. So obviously the nights are drawing in in the northern hemisphere and we're actually getting later and later sunrises but it does mean that those of us on our way to work early in the morning actually get in with a chance of seeing Mercury and Venus before uh, sunrise. So Venus is incredibly, incredibly bright at the minute, uh, just before uh, sunrise, uh, sort of in the eastern sky, pre-dawn. Um, but as we get into December, Mercury is also going to join it. And so that will be just sort of just below Venus, if you sort of track Venus uh, down towards sort of where the sun's going to rise in the southeast, you should be able to spot Mercury. And that's going to get easier though, Throughout December, so around about December sort of 15th is when Mercury will sort of get its furthest position away from the sun, so it'll be highest in the sky before the sun rises and it's too bright to see them anymore. But it'd be a really nice thing to do to spot both Mercury and Venus, like whilst you're opening the first couple of doors of your advent calendar this December. Now, around about the same time of the month, so about sort of mid-December-ish, is when you need to look out for the Geminids Meteor Shower. So this meteor shower is really consistent, so it's a great one for beginners to start with if you've never stayed up to watch a meteor shower before. Cool thing is that Gemini is actually rising, you know, early evening at this time of year, so it's a nice time to be able to go out not too late to try and spot some meteors. There's also going to be about 250 meteors an hour. That's about four a minute. So you've got a really good chance of spotting one. So what you need to do, you need to go outside, preferably lie down on the floor if you can, but make sure you're, you know, wrapped up warm and everything. Um, and just stare at the sky. Now, all the meteors are going to look like they're coming from the constellation of Gemini, which is sort of just above Orion. Um, but if you look elsewhere in the sky, that's when you're going to see them. So maybe if you can find Gemini and sort of put your head, top of your head to the sort of ge where Gemini is and sort of point that towards Gemini and then just look up to the rest of the sky, you might get lucky and see a couple of meteors. The best viewing for the meteor shower is in the Northern Hemisphere, but you will still get a good view in the Southern Hemisphere. It's just Gemini won't be as high in the sky. So you might not be able to see as many per hour as in the Northern Hemisphere. Okay, so the other exciting thing that's happening in this time, again, it's in December around about mid-month, is that there might be a chance to see a comet with the naked eye. So no telescopes are anything needed to be able to spot it. This is Comet 46P Vertanen. And everyone is very, very excited about this because it's what's called a hyperactive comet. So it gives off a lot more water vapor than normal comets do as it gets closer and closer to the sun. And so you could end up with this really big, like very distinctive comet sort of like tail coming off it. Um, so people are very excited that that's going to be visible with the naked eye in mid-December and then once you get binoculars on it, you might be able to see that sort of interesting shape. So it's predicted to get as bright as about three magnitude, which means you should be able to see it in the naked eye even in sort of city suburbs. It won't quite be as bright as, say, one of the planets like Mars in the sky, but it will still be incredibly bright. And so December 15th, 16th is when it's due to get closest to the sun. And at that point, it's gonna be in the constellation of Taurus, just below the Pleiades cluster. So if you find Orion and find Orion's belt and you sort of follow the stars up, you should end up in Taurus and you should be able to try and spot where this comet is. But if you go online, find some star maps, you'll get a sort of detailed position of where it is on the day you're trying to look for it. And interestingly, this was the comet that the Rosetta mission was actually supposed to go to like three years ago. Um, but they actually missed the launch window for that and it ended up going to 67P Churumov Gerasimenko. It might just end up looking a little bit like a diffuse star though, rather than having that really extended cometary tail. These things are notoriously difficult to predict. But if it does turn out that it puts on a show, please, please send me some pictures if you do manage to see it. I'd love to see them. Either tweet them to me or pop a link in the comments below and I might put them in uh, next month's video as well. Okay, so time to head back to Earth with Bump and see what's been happening in the news this month with Astronomy in Space. Now the first thing I want to start with, let us please mourn for a moment the loss of the Kepler spacecraft. You will remember that I said last month that um, it had a gyroscope failure at well, this month. Uh, unfortunately, it was retired by NASA after nine years of detecting over 2,600 exoplanets, which is absolutely incredible. Turned out that eventually it just ran out of fuel, the poor thing, and so we it will no longer be detecting exoplanets at all. We do still have uh, the TESS spacecraft that's just launched that will be carrying on the legacy of Kepler to detect more exoplanets, but really do have to mourn the passing of something that has absolutely revolutionised the field of exoplanet studies. You know, 2,600 
hundred of them that are detected. That is an absolutely incredible feat. But we should expect more discoveries from the last data dump that it gave out as well. So we will be still be hearing from everybody who's working with Kepler data for a long time yet. Speaking of exoplanets though, uh, we found one in like the nearest single star system to the sun. So this is around a star called Barnard Star. And if you're thinking, well, no, because the Alpha Centauri and Proxima Centauri are the closest stars to the sun, right? Y yes, but they're a sort of binary and triple star system. So nothing like our own solar system. So Barnard Star is just a single star system though, just like the sun. So any planets we find around it are gonna be very similar to planets in our own solar system. People have been searching for a planet around Barnard Star for years because it's like the closest single star to the sun and not found anything. Um, but the people in this paper that was published this month, it was from Ribas et al, and they found uh, by taking all of the archive data from the past 20 years from lots and lots of different telescopes and observational surveys, they found if you merge all that data, actually there is a planet in there and it's what we call a super Earth. So it's about three times the mass of the Earth and it has a period of about 233 days around its star. It's actually orbiting very close to what's called the snow line, which is sort of when uh, all the volatile compounds like ammonia and water and all of the carbon things that you need for life, they all sort of condense and freeze out. It's a little bit cold, this planet. But there is something weird going on with its orbit they found, sort of like a little perturbation, which suggests that there might actually be another planet in that system that we haven't detected, similar to how sort of Neptune and Uranus's orbit are affected by Pluto and like the Kuiper Belt. So there could be another planet in this system making it sort of our closest single star system at about six light years away, which is pretty cool. So another thing that I want to talk about that I am surprised didn't make it to the press this month, I don't understand why, because it's really cool. The Milky Way, has a new dwarf satellite galaxy that we have found. So it's the most super diffuse galaxy ever found. It's about three times the size of a full moon in the sky, but it's 400,000 light years away and it's the lowest surface brightness object we've ever seen. So it's amazing that we'd even be able to text this. So it was found in Gaia data. Now Gaia is a satellite that's been launched to map all of the positions and properties and motions of stars in our own Milky Way so we can get a proper 3D map of where stars are, how they're moving around the galaxy and like a proper 3D map. And so in this data they looked for these ultra diffuse objects by looking for stars that had the same properties, that were moving with the same velocity relative to the sun and were clustered together as well in space but weren't part of any other part of the Milky Way and they found this object in a constellation called Antlia which is in the southern hemisphere and they've dubbed it Antlia 2. So now the Milky Way has you know its local group of Andromeda really really far away and then its other dwarf galaxies the large Magellanic Cloud the small Magellanic Cloud and Antlia 2. All right so the big story this month was whether <laughs> A Muamua is an alien spacecraft. So for those of you who don't know, a Muamua is an object that was detected back in October 2017 by the Pan-STARRS telescope in Hawaii on Mauna Kea. Now, the Pan-STARRS telescope usually searches for asteroids and it tracks asteroids motions through the sky looking for anything that's going to move that might be a potential threat to Earth. So it noticed this object that was moving incredibly, incredibly fast that had just sort of looped around the sun and was then moving away from us. And the observation showed that after you tracked it for a couple of days and sort of worked out its orbit, that it had clearly come from outside the solar system and it had a completely different orbit to what we know for comets and asteroids. And now this idea of sort of interstellar objects that travel between star systems has sort of been posited for a while because when you have um, a star form and then you get the sort of disk around it that planets are gonna form from, planetary formation models say that you throw out so much junk in that formation process just because so many bits of rock are flying around and interacting with each other and getting their orbits all perturbed so that things fly off into space and so the idea was we should be seeing hundreds of these things so this was the first we thought of its kind that had been detected sort of as a messenger to the solar system that was going to head back outwards again 
And this thing was really only bright for about two weeks because it was moving so fast away from us after it had sort of looped around the sun and gone out. There was just a race for observations to try and figure out what the hell it was before it disappeared from the solar system. So it didn't have a coma like a comet does, you know, that tail that you get from the outgassing from going around the sun. It didn't have a halo like an asteroid did. So it didn't really look like anything in our own solar system that we knew of, which sort of gave more precedence to this theory that it was actually from outside our solar system. And then also further observations showed that it was a really weird shape. It was sort of really elongated. It was sort of like 200 meters by like 20 meters from sort of the different images that we were getting that showed that it was sort of rotating, but not rotating smoothly like the Earth does. It was sort of tumbling. It didn't have any set period of rotation that was smooth. So there was this paper back in July 2018 from McKelly that sort of combined all of the data that we had from um, the Canada France Hawaii telescope, the VLT in Chile and some Hubble Space Telescope data to try and figure out you know what speed was this thing moving at and they actually detected that it had a sudden increase in its acceleration that wasn't due to just gravitational forces from around the sun you know from it sort of like a slingshot around the sun. Now that's expected with comets because, you know, when they uh, outgas, when their ice melts from getting close to the sun and they do that big outgassing coma tail, that kind of acts like a little bit of a booster or a thruster and it sort of gives them a little bit of a kick in their acceleration. But we'd already heard that this thing isn't like a comet at all, so that would be weird if it had done that. So the paper that came out this month uh, was from Bidley and Loeb in Harvard and they were sort of trying to explain this boost in acceleration. And so most of the paper is devoted to working out whether um, solar radiation pressure could explain this uh, acceleration in a moment. Now solar radiation pressure comes from the fact that you have photons coming from the sun that have energy and therefore momentum. And so when they hit an object, they can transfer their energy and their momentum to that object and give it a little uh, speed kick, a little bit of acceleration. And so they try to work out whether um, there could be enough energy from the sun hitting a Momoa to give it that boost in acceleration that had been seen. And so they said, yes, it would have enough energy, but the thing that it was hitting would have to be incredibly, incredibly big and also really, really thin to be able to transfer all of that energy and momentum to it. That's not like anything that we've seen in our own solar system. Comets and asteroids don't look like that. Obviously, Oumuamua is not from our solar system, so maybe it does, and maybe that's why we've been getting those weird images that we think that it's sort of really long and thin and sort of tumbling over itself. Maybe it's because it's nothing like we've ever seen here. But the authors of this paper said, well, the things that we know on Earth that we've theorised are photon light sails. So a photon light sail is a sort of theoretical way that we might travel to other planets. So we would harness the energy of the sun, we would uh, have this huge big sail that photons from the sun would hit into it and transfer energy to it so that you could move a spacecraft faster. And so they're saying that, you know, maybe a Muamua is a technological relic of some other alien civilization that's perhaps been forgotten about, it's been kicked out of whatever orbit it was supposed to be in, perhaps it was like a transport cargo that was using a light sail to travel around. Maybe it is actually an alien probe that's been sent to investigate our solar system and they're traveling using one of these big light sails. So this is all pure speculation, you know, there's no way that we could prove that it was aliens. Oumuamua is far too far away now for us to actually resolve it and see it and prove that it was aliens. It's completely speculative. It's much more likely that it is one of these objects that's been thrown out from a solar system formation um, nearby. Perhaps we can even trace sort of its direction of what solar system it may have come from. If it did, that would be really, really cool. So we just have to keep an eye out for more and more of these objects. Perhaps we might see more of these interstellar objects that are thrown out from um, sort of star system and planet formation. Because through models, there should be thousands of these objects that get thrown out every time there is planet formation around a star. And so there could be hundreds passing through the solar system right now, but they could just be too faint for us to see and we just got lucky here with a Momoa uh, to actually find it. But even if it was aliens, uh, they didn't exactly stop, did they? They're actually physically accelerating away from us, so no need to panic, I think we'll be fine. <laughs> so bringing it roughly, definitely back down to Earth now, um, and speaking of Hawaii as well, the Pan-STARRS telescope, one piece of news that came out from this month is about the 30 meter telescope 
um, that's due to be constructed on top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. The Hawaii Supreme Court ruled four to one in favor of the TMT getting constructed. Now, for those who haven't heard the backstory here, the 30 meter telescope was due for construction in Hawaii a couple of years back, but it's been met with a lot of resistance from locals because Mauna Kea is a sacred mountain to them. So Mauna Kea is literally the best spot in the world for astronomy. You are so far away from light pollution. It is 4,000 meters above sea level. So you've got much less atmosphere to look for. The humidity up there is non-existent. And so there's no water vapor that's gonna disturb your observations. So the seeing is absolutely fantastic. It is the best place in the world to do astronomy from. The 30 meter telescope is the next class of telescopes that we're gonna build. It is three times bigger than anything that we have built before. And it's gonna see things, you know, nine times more detail than the Keck telescopes, which are currently on Mount Achaia. So it makes sense to build the best new telescope in the best spot for astronomy, except when that obviously interferes with someone's cultural practices. Now, there's no legal limit for how many telescopes that we could build on Mount Achaia. That's never been set in stone. The problem is that Mount Achaia is part of a ceded land that the Americans basically forcibly took away from the natives when they annexed Hawaii. So there is a lot of cultural and political um, history there that is so important to recognize. So it's an incredibly difficult situation. Of course, as an astronomer, I want this thing to be built, but not if it's gonna interfere with someone's cultural practices that go back, you know, millennia. So what the Hawaii Supreme Court have ruled is that yes, it can go ahead, construction can start, but three of the 13 telescopes that are currently on top of the mountain have to be decommissioned. And so therefore we're more effectively sharing the mountain with the locals and not interfering with their cultural practices in any way. Lots of political drama around this, but construction can go ahead, which if you are an astronomer is good news. So that's all I've got time for this month. Remember to send me any pictures you get this month of the comet or even the meteor shower. I'd absolutely love to see them. Until next month, I'm Dr. Becky, over and out.